thank you for seeing me, sir. I know you're busy running a movie studio. Are you kidding, kid? You see this big chair I'm sitting in? It's made out of money. I had a chair custom made out of actual money. You know where that money came from? Your last feature. Captain Warlock and the Invisible Cape with a Fist. Write me another one like that, kid, and I can have a wife made out of money instead of a wife who thinks I am. I'd like to do something different this time. Different is good. Well, unless it's bad. I want to write a movie about J.M.W. Turner, the great British painter. Who's Taken? Really? Somebody else is already doing him? No, Taken. Like, terrorists grab him, and Neeson gets him back. Liam, in love with this man, but we gotta make these movies fast. He's not in his 20s, you know? If we don't hurry up, Taken 7 is gonna be about who took his bingo card. So, Depp is this fruitcake painter, and Liam busts him out. I don't see a role for Scarlet. You got a role for Scarlet. Well, there is a housekeeper with terrible psoriasis. You're killing me, kid. This movie is about a man in the thrall of the visual. A man who sees light the way nobody else does, and he tries to paint it. I see where you're headed, kid. You know who I make movies for? Average people. You know what's so great about average people? There's a lot of them. I love average people. They buy medium-sized sodas and popcorn, and every year they go to the same movies with different numbers at the end of the title. I don't make movies for Harvard commies like David Edelstein. You want to make a movie he's going to like? Have him put up the money. I think I understand. You do? Well, how about if Turner is part of the Justice League of the Invisible Cape with the fist? By day, he appears to be a dumpy little artist tottering around the British coast. But his secret identity is the painter. Oil paint flies out of his fingertips and gums up the Nazi tanks. It could work. But first, we have to listen to a show featuring America's greatest living film critic. Not that, Edelstein. What did I tell you, kid? And now, the star of Magic Mike 5, Relaxed Fit, Colin McEnroe. I feel like I could be in the relaxed fit version of Magic Mike. All right, joining us right now is America's greatest living film critic, David Edelstein. He's the film critic for everything, for New York Magazine, Fresh Air, CBS Sunday Morning, and probably some other platform. I'm not, do you have, like, have you added a new platform lately? Uh, well, nobody will listen to me in, at my house. <laughs> so I would love it if I could be the film critic in my house. You be the film critic at my house. Okay, all we'll right. Listen to because you. my children just make fun of me terribly whenever I try to hold forth on film, which is how it really should be in all our lives. Did you take your children to see Into the Woods yet? Uh, my children saw Into the Woods on DVD without me and mm. liked it. Uh, seemed to have no problems with the uh, veering into tragedy in the in the second half. You always forget that kids are perfectly capable. Uh, remember, remember how parents were always worried about the corrupting influence of monstrous fairy tales on mm -hmm. their children, thinking they would be damaged for life? And the kids go, oh, that's no big deal. That's how it is. Well, that's, you're, that's the Bruno Bettelheim argument, right, that basically fairy tales exist to, to help children process traumas that they already have. They're already worried about what happens if their parents die and they're stuck with horrible step-parents or something like that. Exactly. And, and when I was a kid, uh, uh, those who, who grew up with me, uh, apologies for much, but I will know that I was, you know, addicted to horror films and that I, you know, I, I would be the last person you would imagine to go up and talk about, you know, good hygiene, good cultural hygiene for your kids. And worry about being damaged by, you know, some some fairy tale character getting killed, and yet here I am saying, ah, "Into the Woods" is a little rough for kids. Well, I mean, the thing that I Into the Woods subverts is the notion of happily ever after. It doesn't entirely subvert it, but you, I mean, first of all, I, I always thought Sondheim's musical, the, the first act is a, a, a freestanding, amazing musical all by itself with incredible songs about sort of your typical fairy tale progression. Absolutely. Done, you know. It's on, a great farce. Yeah. It's a great farce. And then, the, then there's this whole second act that says, well, what if that whole happily ever after equation doesn't really work quite the way that we're always told? So that's that's subversive, but... I agree. I walked out of the movie and I thought, I wonder if little kids can handle that. But that you're, we're both being ridiculous. Of course they can. They're, we're being ridiculous, but I do think that the second act doesn't doesn't earn doesn't earn its tragedy in quite the way no. that the first act earns its laughs and enchantment. Um, I just think I think Sondheim is a pretty sour and cynical guy. He may be our greatest living, you know, composer lyricist. He may be a god, but he's still. He still couldn't make that work at that particular stage. I don't. I don't think. I think it's just sentim It's sour, cynical, sentimental. It doesn't have any great insight into the way things really go wrong in Happily Ever Afterville. It's just this idea that he's Stephen Sondheim and he's with James Lapine and he cannot believe in that there is such a thing as happily ever after. But he doesn't tell us why. He just says yeah. we can't. You know, there is no such thing as happily ever after, kids. 
but he doesn't really convince us that the seeds for these characters' destruction is in their behavior early on. And if it is, if their behavior early on is absurd, well, so what? They're fairy tale characters. <laughs> we know this. Well, I think also what he thinks is, I mean, if, if you can look at it as a piece, as of a of a of a whole of you know follies and company and hap- and merrily we roll along. And I mean, all of these things are about sort of cracks in in the facade of what we think of as conventional happiness, right? The conventional happiness is really not to be expected from life. It is to be hoped for. Mm-hmm. but rarely achieved. The beauty of comedy, though, is that it allows you to glimpse the abyss and keep dancing. Right. Or if I, if that's not a mixed metaphor. Or keep, you know, there there is a is way... Is this a segue into the interview? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a segue into a little night music, which is, which into the, into the Woods very much resembles melodically in certain ways, although a little night music is much better. But that's as bleak as, as all get out at the end, and yet... It's still the characters are still waltzing. There is a sense that you know, the the form fits perf- The form fits beautifully in uh, a little night music. It's not as jarring as Into the Woods. So I'm happy to talk about the interview if you want. All right. No, I was just wondering whether it was a segue. I should say I'm talking to David Edelstein. As you can tell, we don't really need an actual topic. <laughs> we'll just talk. Uh, our number, if you want to uh, call in, eight six zero two seven five seven two six six. Already a uh, comment from uh, producer Tucker Ives pointing out that Maurice Sendak would slap both of us for even contemplating the idea that children can't handle uh, scary things, uh, and that is true. But we we corrected ourselves. We self-corrected. He doesn't need to slap us from the grave. 860-275-7266. Well, we'll, well, we can do the interview. I guess it's sort of top of mind right now. People are talking about this. Well, we don't know. What One thing they're talking about is we don't know for sure that the North Koreans were behind that hack. Right. There are a lot of rumblings now that it could have been an inside job, disgruntled employees. Could have been the Weinsteins. Could have been a lot of people. I w- <laughs> <laughs> well, the Weinsteins, listen, you know what? Harvey's campaigns could easily go. Harvey Weinstein, I just heard the most appalling story about bright eyes. I don't even know if I'm allowed to tell it. Is it bright eyes or big eyes? Big eyes, big sorry. Eyes. Big eyes. Um, you know, the Tim Burton movie, yeah. you, you would think that, you know, uh, Tim makes a small movie. He makes it on a, a much smaller budget very, very quickly. And you would think maybe with minimal interference. But in fact, Harvey was just – that movie was a year in the editing room. And Harvey's fingerprints are all over it for better or worse. I think based on what I've heard, for worse. The movie – it's a very fun movie. But it's got this narration that does not fit mm-hmm. and was not in the original script. It's narrated by a character played by Danny Houston. And it just does not make sense in the in the movie. And why are we talking about Harvey Weinstein? Well, l- let me just let me bring everybody up to date. If you don't know, Oscars. If you've lived through the Academy Awards in the last twenty years, you have lived under the reign of Harvey Weinstein because the man is an Oscar machine. Everything he does nowadays, he has these little people in his head. It's his parents. And it's his old Jewish parents and their old Jewish taste. And he knows how to read the Acad- the Motion Picture Academy. And he will make movies like The Imitation Game mm-hmm. and, and Big Eyes that are, you know, we, use, we throw around the term Oscar bait, but that is what they are. He will calculate this movie to appeal to the greatest number of Academy voters. He will release it at Christmas time. The movies that he does not like, that he does not think will win awards, get buried. OK, he, he will put very little, if anything, behind them. He will focus on his campaigns. He will get his armies out. He will have spies everywhere. He will be hacking. You know, so he will be in <laughs> Sony's computer system. Right. But this is this is I mean, everybody nowadays, if, if, if you're if you're all going to be obsessed, if we're all going to be obsessed with awards, let's understand who like the mad geniuses are behind these behind these things, these campaigns. And why they're turning out the way they are. All right. So, well, this is a good segue into the interview. Speaking of mad geniuses, um, well, I guess Kim Jong Un is not actually a genius. But um, so we've been through this whole drama. We, as you say, we don't really know who hacked Sony. Uh, we don't really know who hacked the North Korean uh, computer system. We don't know anything. All we really know is that somehow or other, this movie 
that Sony felt sufficiently challenged about this movie that they pulled it out of distribution. They said theaters were not going to be willing to show it. And then they pushed it back into distribution to independent theaters that said that they would show it. Plus, you can see it online. I think it did $15 million online the first weekend, which is... Yeah, and $3 million in theaters. Yeah. So, so first of all, uh, am I ethically obligated to go see the interview? Well, I, ethically, I think I think you should. I think it's a it's a it's a really good movie. Oh well, then then um, I was listening to uh, <laughs> I was listening to to uh, Fresh Air uh, bef- before our this show went on, and uh, the uh, was it Bob Mankoff, the yeah, uh, yeah. editor of the of the of the cartoons uh, at the at the New Yorker, was saying that you know cartoons people say are supposed to speak truth to power, but these days power is not listening, so we don't do. Well, this is one case where speaking truth to power, power listens. If you if you go up to a poster of Kim Jong Un and you draw a phallus on it and you draw big boobs on it and you send it to North Korea, Kim Jong Un is going to listen because he controls every single little tiny aspect of that culture. That is the most insular culture. I mean, outside of, you know, in Borneo, you know, they mm-hmm. they in uh, 200 years ago in Borneo, they were less insulated than North Korea is at this particular moment in history. And this is a spectacularly effective, dirty, infantile, emasculating, uh, smutty, um, you know, rude, crude, lewd, snood. Snood, is that a word? Yes. Snood is a snood. Uh, hair cock a snood. Yeah. You, ca- you it, cock, cock a snoot. It cocks a snoot at, mm. at Kim Jong-un. Um is it a great move, great comedy? No, but I thought it was really funny. And just when you look, I mean, he he drives Kim Jong Un. Uh, spoiler alert: to uh, soil himself, uh, to vomit, and to soil himself on live television in front of the world. And you, Kim Jong Un, is supposed to be descended from God. That wasn't just a spoiler alert. That was a spoiler alert. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> Kim Jong Kim Jong Un is supposed to be descended from on high, you know, from God, and uh, the idea of just putting a likeness of him in a chair and having him evacuate his bowels um, is just a, a a wonderful thing to do, and something that North Koreans cannot do. Um, all right, so you sold me. I mean, I think any any public radio listener <laughs> really wants like to exactly see that. The I know. kind of movie that they flock to. Franco's not great. You know, I mean, the thing about Franco is um, he, that's James Franco as opposed yes. to the dictator Franco. Like, that's <laughs> he the, that's sucked. The, that's the sequel. The dictator Franco sucked, <laughs> and I just want to make it very clear now: we are talking about you know bird, birds of a feather. But James Franco, everything he does nowadays is part of the James Franco project. Right. So when he gives a performance, it's always going to be in quotation marks because it's another addition to the James Franco project, and he overdoes it terribly. He um, he mugs and he winces and he grimaces and he he's sometimes very funny. I mean, sometimes when you go too far, you hit notes that no one else has ever hit before. He may but, be the first actor to intentionally jump the shark. I mean, that's basically what he did, right? I mean, he is he is maybe Joaquin Phoenix, but um, well, he's you know, that's an that's an interesting that's an interesting way of putting it because. We're looking at a lot of actors now who, uh, to switch over briefly to Johnny Depp, you know, who, um, like Val Kilmer before him and, and others, entered the weird Brando phase without going through the good Brando <laughs> phase. Um, they were inspired by this giant wreck of, of, an, of an actor who did not take his own talent seriously. Or did not did not really believe in it. This is like George Bernard Shaw's statement that America went from primitivism to decadence without it, it, an intervening period. Exactly, of civilization. Yeah. exactly. And this is what you're seeing now. It may be what you're seeing in Franco, although Franco at least has other outlets. But it's certainly what you're seeing in Depp, and um, and I think that and I, and I think it's really sad that people you know that some people become stars, and they feel that now now it gives them a chance to sort of clown. On a two hundred million dollar budget, it, it, that, and that does that does seem to be kind of what's happening. And with each of them, it might be interesting. A good project for somebody. Somebody's already done this online. We know this is to figure out the last movie each one of them made before they they tipped into that area. You know, when was the last time James Franco didn't the final time he didn't have quotation marks 
uh, around whatever he was doing. Well, we know Depp worked with Brando on Don Juan de Marco, yeah. and and uh, which Ooh, is I not a movie. I've forgotten about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's kind of fascinating because Brando d- is actually playing a character, and he's taking it relatively seriously. You know, in the last twenty five years of his life, he never learned any lines. He had a little earpiece in his ear, and somebody was reading the lines to him. And he claimed it would allow him to be more spontaneous. <laughs> Don't you wish you could get away with that? <laughs> Don't you wish you're, you're – oh, maybe maybe Kion is – are any of your producers in there whispering everything you say into your ear? Because, no. Oh. I, I did try to claim that I just wanted to be a, a suitcase, which is what <laughs> – remember Brando when he was cast in Superman? He said he wanted to be a suitcase. <laughs> he didn't actually want to be physically – he thought his voice should just come out of a suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have tried to claim that a few times. We're talking to David Edelstein. Uh, our number, if you want to talk about either the best or the worst movie you've seen all year or – uh, any of the other topics that we're going to be winding in and around, uh, our number is 860-275-7266. Or you may tweet us at WNPR Colin. Again, the phone number, 860-275-7266. So I'm, I'm actually surprised, and I think a lot of people probably did are surprised to hear you say that the interview is good. Uh, it's a good movie. And, and, and you're a little bit out of sync with uh, other critics about this, too. I mean, you're, uh, you're, that's the, the most fervid endorsement I've heard uh, of uh, of the interview. I don't understand. I heard before I saw it, you know, oh, it's just a smutty bromance. Mm. Um, it's a movie with some substance. I mean, they clearly got to know the propaganda machine that is North Korea mm. in order to be able to explode it satirically. So they have Potemkin grocery stores and they have little fat boys planted on the corner waving at the car that's carrying uh, Seth Rogen and James Franco as it goes along to counter the myth that, you know, Kim Jong-un is starving his people. Um, the way the propaganda is, uh, I mean, there's a very interesting book out now called uh, Without You, There Is No Us by, uh, spoiler alert, edited by my wife, but it's still really good. Um, and um, this young woman, uh, Suki Kim, sort of, sort of went behind the scenes and taught the children of the North Korean elite as part of a uh, sort of evangelical Christian organization and then turned around and wrote a book which made them all very unhappy but when you read the book and you see the level of just the 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 jar in the seal hermetically sealed jar in which these people are living and the kind of propaganda that surrounds them you see that this this film is in fact an act of cultural war which is fine mm-hmm. it's not an act of war war it's not an act of physical war it's an act of cultural war and therefore, the fart jokes and the erection jokes and the puke jokes and all the other jokes have, have a political context. And a, as it did in South Park, as it did in Team America World Police mm-hmm. and South Park Bigger, Longer, Uncut. You know me, Colin. You know there is no show in the history of television that I, I will praise more highly than South Park because mm-hmm. the, the mixture of political sophistication and poop jokes is to me the the, the summit of Mount Parnassus. <laughs> we're talking to David Edelstein. Hey, wh- while we're on the subject of uh, you growing up uh, loving the scary movies and gruesome and horrible movies, so this is a way in which you and I are very different. I have a I I have a very, you know, easily crossed threshold of fear at the movies, and uh, I think I've probably even told you that like people like Bill Curry will not go to a scary movie with me anymore because we went to 28 Days Later and I made all these kind of bird-like cheeping noises and <laughs> held my hand up to my eye. And he went, you stop that! Stop that right now! And I, you know, I, I, things. So I want to know about the Babadook. Given the fact that I'm a baby, I'm a big baby, is, is there any chance that I could handle that movie or would I, would, would I be like Kim Jong-un avoiding <laughs> Uh, right there in my uh, comfortable movie um, scene. No, no. The Baba the Babadook is is a work of art, and it's a it's a moral work. It's a it's a uh, it has a very very strong and 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 deep subtext. It is not a movie full of cheap tricks. It's not an overwhelmingly gory movie. It's very very scary. Do things pop but, out? I don't like it when things pop out. I when mean, you open a door. And- Something pops out. I don't yeah, like that. Yeah, it's not, it's not, fu- I mean, maybe once or twice because you have to do that <laughs> nowadays. But it's not a movie where every single time, you know, where, where, you know, a hand lands on the heroine's shoulder and she turns around and it's her boyfriend going, surprise. I hate, you know, false, false jolts are, are, are now like the bane of my existence. Um, the only other film I can compare it to is The Conjuring. It's a much better film than The Conjuring. The Conjuring, though, like this film, 
created uh, an amazing sense of visual menace where what you didn't see was far scarier than what you did. Or the director can frame a character in such a way as to leave uh, a bunch of space on the side that you know should be filled with something. You know, a, a really great master of composition. Look at look at a great horror movie sometime. It's not just what's in the frame. It's the space that's left outside the frame that you think, what is there just well, beyond like, the range of the camera? Don't look now. Nicholas Rogue's masterpiece is that Absolutely. way. Absolutely. That, that, that's, to me, that's, I, I was able to get through that. I should have a site where I rate these movies, but it would be like the number of, of benzodiazepines <laughs> I would have to take. So that would be like a three out of N movie. No, Baba Duke, Baba Duke <laughs> is See, that gorgeous. That scares me even you saying that. Is, is gorgeous looking. And it's, it's full of quotations from old uh, horror films, especially silent horror films, but used in, an, in, you know, in a very respectful, not in a campy way. But it's about motherhood also. It's a, it's a film about a mother who really cannot manage her child. Her husband has died. She, she, her child, she has an eccentric child. Yeah, it's it's like a, The Exorcist. Yeah, well, a bit, really, except... You know, Ellen Burson's having some problems with her kids. She takes the kid to a hypnotist, okay. to a neurologist, to a psychiatrist. Okay. No, but, you know, I'm really glad you mentioned that because The Exorcist, like The Conjuring, these are very sort of culturally reactionary movies. Mm-hmm. In, in The Exorcist, um, the reason that this beautiful angelic child is possessed by the devil is that she doesn't have a father, is that her mother consorts with homosexuals and um, other showbiz types. Right. You and know? It, it is, I agree with you that it's, it's Philip Reeve's triumph of the, ther- of the therapeutic made into a movie. It's because ba- the other thing that's happening is she's doing, she's accessing the therapeutic community yes. and everybody in the audience is going, are you out of your skull? Your daughter's possessed. Get exactly. a priest. Get you an need, exorcist. You need the patriarchal Catholic church. You need a man to come in holding a Bible and to expel this child because you didn't raise her right. right. You left her vulnerable. Well, that is not the case in the Baba Duke. The, there is no Catholic exorcism that's performed. The exorcism, an exorcism does have to be performed, but it has to be from the woman herself. And there's no sense that the Baba Duke will ever be permanently gone. You can't completely expel the Baba Duke because you're always going to have feelings. Anybody who's a parent knows that there are just times. Have you ever had this feeling like, have you ever, your kid is just done something and a voice comes out of you that sounds like Linda Blair and the exorcist and you say, where did that come from? Yeah, pretty you know? much all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. That's pretty much my parenting well, style. Well, that's the Babadook. That's the ba- See the Babadook. I will really. see the Babadook. See, is it, I will it's playing see the here, right? I yes, know it is. I think, it, I, think it's open here. I think it's open here, yeah. It's on VOD. And it's but, VOD, yeah, I but, saw that, But, yeah. you know, you all must see the Babadook. It's so good. All right, before we go into a break, here's Wendy from Colchester, who I think wants to uh, tell us the worst movie of the year oh, please. by her lights. Hi, Wendy. Hi, how are you? Good. Actually, there's two worst movies, and if anyone has heard of them, they should run as fast as they can. The first movie is Birdman. Oh. Oh. You're watching a movie, and you're two feet away from... Wendy! Oh. First of all, you, first of all, at you, any one you point just... In time, and all they Thank do is you. argue and fight for two hours. You would not Thank believe how you. many people Thank in you. Pittsburgh ran out of the theater. Thank you. And, right. and God bless the guy who was the manager. He actually gave me my money back as he laughed and said he loved it. All right. So, so what's that you... one was... Okay, first of all, you just, you just obnoxious. And then Into the Woods, we couldn't wait to see it. The commercials do not let anyone know that it is a musical. It is such a crime. We were there for two hours looking at each other, falling asleep. Wait a minute, oh, you yeah. didn't want to see a musical? Into the Woods, the yeah. actors were given a platform to be in a musical, and that's the end of it. There was really no storyline. The movie was all in the dark. Wendy, the you songs didn't went wait a minute. On for it had a like eight hideously story long line. time. Yeah. We Wendy, were so you, bored. You didn't know Into the Woods was a musical? It didn't say on the commercial. I know, but like, did you, like we're we'll just, no, wait, hold on, hold on, Wendy, hit, Wendy. And we didn't read on it. Wendy, so hold on for a second. Did you listen to NPR and yeah. you didn't know that yeah. it was a musical? Wendy, do you, I like, remember the play on Broadway, I remember yeah. the musical, but the commercials didn't lead anyone on to believe it was going to be a, a musical. There wasn't one song that they showed in the commercials. I know, but you knew it was like a Sondheim musical, right? So you really did know it was Into the Woods had been a play a long time ago. All right. But why didn't they show no, songs or anything I guarantee you, in the commercial? I, I guarantee you. A, Not only was it singing, if you went to see the play, you'd be less bored because the songs didn't seem to last 20 minutes a song. All right, Wendy, you and I uh, would not get along. 
uh, I, I, I love the first thing you said, though, about Birdman. Oh, no, you made Edelstein happy. <laughs> Very happy. Colin and I really disagree about Birdman. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of people think it's the best movie of the year. I think it's it's uh, really an amazing piece of work. You know, the French have a word, tour de force. Um, actually, three words. Uh, but it, it's a tour de force. And it's a tour de force of uh, kin- kinesthetic mise-en-scene. Um, that made no sense. But it's a it's a tour de force, and it's a... Uh, a triumph on so many different levels, but it's a completely empty movie, Colin. I'm sorry. It's a movie that flies. You know, you used it. You compared it to at some point to Icarus. I think the director's Icarus. And when he gets all fancy and magical realist, he flies too high and the movie goes crashing down to earth. All right. Well, I'm still reeling from Wendy. I can't even compose myself. Wendy, by the way. My Fair Lady, West Side Story, Oklahoma, these are all musicals, too. I don't want you to be disappointed every time you watch one of these things, all right? Those are musicals. Knowing this time I'd run from him. He spread pitch on the stairs, and I'm caught on unawares. Well, it means that he cares. All right, we're back. We're back with David Edelstein, America's greatest living film critic. He's the film critic for New York Magazine, for Fresh Air, and for CBS Sunday Morning. Uh, and uh, it's the end of the year. He's having to do best lists and worst lists and all those kinds of lists. I'm less, in- I'm less interested in the- your list than what you have to say about very specific movies. But I do know that Selma, uh, which I wanted so much to see in New York this weekend, I just couldn't squeeze one more movie in. Uh, but I know that's uh, it's high on your list uh, of, of best movies this year. And first of all, just give people a sense. Uh, I assume people from the title can, although with Wendy, she may think that that is a musical. So who knows? For Wendy's sake, explain what uh, Selma is. Well, there was a very famous Wendy, uh, there was a very, I'm sorry, this is so horribly patronizing, but Wendy, once upon a time, there was a, this magical kingdom called the Confederacy, and they made life very difficult for black people, and for some reason, the Civil War didn't end it. And they said, I wish more than anything, I could vote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And and even Oprah Winfrey couldn't vote. I mean, she well, she goes up to the window at the beginning of this movie and- not as, not as Oprah Winfrey. Not as Oprah Winfrey, but but if that had been Oprah Winfrey, you know, she even a billionaire cannot can, could not vote under those conditions. Um, so, uh, this guy named um, Martin, this prince named Martin Luther King, goes, "We're going to drop this now." Uh, goes down to Selma, and he's going to lead a march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, to the governor's mansion. Um, now, there has been a, a great deal of controversy now raised by Joseph Califano, who worked very closely with LBJ, that the film demonizes LBJ, who's played by Tom Wilkinson. By the way, uh, David Oyelowo uh, plays uh, Martin Luther King and I think gives the performance of the year. Tom Wilkinson is very fine as um, uh, LBJ. They're both British actors. Uh, Tim Roth is around playing George Wallace, another British actor. Uh, so it's all, it's basically, the movie is all Brits. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Califano complained that um, it was unfair to LBJ. I don't think LBJ comes off as the villain in the film at all. In fact, I don't think he comes off badly. Um, if you've listened to a lot of LBJ's tapes, which are fascinating, um, you see that he was not a... He was not one of these great orators in the in the JFK Abe Lincoln tradition. That wasn't what he did best. He was a behind the scenes kind of guy. He was a he was a he was still a senator when he was president. He was still he could do what Barack Obama and Jimmy Carter and all these other idealists couldn't do. He could pull up his sleeves and he could get in there and he could fight. And what he tells King in the movie is this isn't the year for the Voting Rights Act. We have this great society legislation that I want to pass. It's really good. It's going to help you. It's going to help your people. Let's focus on this. And then next year, once we have this under our belt, let's go after the Voting Rights Act when we've sort of softened everybody up a bit. And King says, no, we're doing it now. We're in Selma now. We're going to march. And he forces LBJ's hand. And as we know, LBJ did ultimately see what was happening in Selma, and he went on the air and he used the phrase "We shall overcome," and it was a it was a mighty moment. It was a you know it was um, it was a turning point. 
Now, Califano is saying that, no, 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 LBJ never said don't do it now. He said, he, he said to King, let's pick some place. You go down and you do it, and then we'll get this Voting Rights Act. And, and he says that as early in 65 as January, there, there's a phone conversation that we can listen to where LBJ is talking to, to Dr. King uh, and, and, and talking about how there's not going to be anything as effective as all black people being able to vote. Uh, and and that, that he does want to make you know the Voting Rights uh, Act this big initiative for, for him and for his administration. And I think, you know, I mean, it, we do have to re-debate this question every single time, right? Every time some historical tweak I- I- is done, we have, to, we have to have a new conversation about that specific thing. Is it a tweak? Is it a gross violation of fact? Does it s- advance the storyline without substantially, you know, advancing a falsehood? So I'm sensing from your words that you're willing to cut the movie some slack on this. Well, I'm very... No, I'm not, actually. I'm not. In fact, it really threw me for a loop. Mm-hmm. This is one of these things when, when, you're, when you're a film critic and you respond to a movie, and even if you think you know as much about the subject, I thought I knew a lot about LBJ. I saw that god-awful uh, Tony-winning Broadway Cranston, show with yeah. Brian Cranston, which is the closest I've come to walking out of a show in a long time. And um, and I've read uh, uh, two of the Robert K. Rowe books. What have they been, three now? I think I've they're, read yeah. I've read two of them. And uh, and I've read uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin. I, I'm trying to tell you I know things. <laughs> you know things. And so um, it sort of pulled the rug out from under me because I actually thought this was a very balanced picture of the LBJ that I knew. And it was also a different slant on King. You know, there's there has been some criticism that the film doesn't bring out, you know, King the Christian. Uh, but my point has always been that, you know, he might have had a dream that he would go to the top of the mountain, but without um, the legislation, without the National Guard, without his unbelievable ability to manage people, without his shrewdness as a politician, that dream would not have come to fruition. And I was grateful for the sort of hard nuts and bolts negotiations that happen in the film. And he and, and, and the way that he, that he pushes LBJ into an area that I didn't think on the evidence LBJ wanted to go. Maybe I'm wrong about that. And, and that's very humbling. Well, the, the conversation will be interesting to watch unfold. I was trying to figure out today whether any of the filmmakers had pushed back at all against Califano. I find that as interesting. I mean, for example, when uh, when the movie Lincoln was criticized by our own Congressman Joe Courtney uh, for getting the Connecticut vote wrong, um, I found the answers that came, I mean, I really like Tony Kushner a lot, and I'd just done an evening on stage with him, but I thought I found his answers hard to take, and, and, I, and I find myself saying, you know, Spielberg made a point of saying that this DVD had to go out to all the schools and be this educational tool and be part of, a, of history and social studies curricula. Well, in that case, you kind of have to get it right, right? I mean, you, 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 there's no reason to get the Connecticut vote wrong. Um, yeah. And no, well, there there was a reason in terms of how he was, you know, constructing the drama. Right. Um, if that is the case here, I thought it was a, a, an extraordinarily nuanced and interesting, fascinating depiction of their relationship. Mm-hmm. If it is wrong, if it's unfair to LBJ. That's uh, that's really upsetting. But I don't yeah. think we know that yet. I, I want to hear what they yeah. have to say back and, and how that conversation unfolds. But Colin, yeah, I feel like I should have known it. You know, I mean, we, you know, I, I hate when people, when critics go to see movies and they, they accept hook, line, and sinker. The fee. I don't do that with every movie. And I, I, have, to, I have to say, but, without buttering you up, I think, think you are extraordinarily conscientious about, I mean, it's so obvious when you write reviews, when you talk on Fresh Air and stuff like that, that you have, you've done the homework. If there's a book, you read the book. You know, I mean, not every critic does that. Uh, but yeah, I but think this is a big, this is a big, big, big deal. And I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. And, you know, I, I want to, I'll want to go for, go, go on and talk about it, you know, in light of these new revelations. Um, and those of you who have a chance to listen to LBJ having his conversations on the John and wherever else he had them, the man was really was really larger than life. He was an amazing character. It, 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 that's a great tragedy. That that the great LBJ movie should come one of these days. The great LBJ biopic because that's. 
That's an amazing story. Could be Rogan and Franco. We'll make it. <laughs> They've got the whole poop part of it down, yeah. the Doris Kearns Goodwin exactly, poop part. Exactly, exactly. So th- they can just start from there and, and build on it. We're talking to David Edelstein. Ah, God, this whole show is like flying by. What's, what's happening here? All right, so let's take a break. Uh, that We gather ourselves and uh, give you a, a killer a final segment. Wendy's already called back at least once. She may call again. I'm squinting my eyes. Did the North Korean hackers ever find out why Sony greenlighted sex tape? Today's show was produced by Colin, Tucker Ives, and me, Kyone Wolf. Our interns today are Lily Tyson and Jackie Filson. Greg Hill appeared in the intro and tweets for us at WNPR Colin. The part of Bill Curry was played by Seth Rogen. For show pages, articles, and the Faith Middleton Show staff's bootleg copy of Winter's Tale, visit our website, WNPR.org. On tomorrow's show, the best jazz of 2014. And now... Back to Colin. Actually, according to producer Tucker Ives, uh, one of the filmmakers of Selma has been talking, at least on Twitter, about this and saying that LBJ's stall on voting in favor of the war on poverty is in fantasy made up for a film uh, that people should interrogate history. Don't take uh, the filmmaker's word for it. Don't take Califano's word for it. Uh, let it come alive for yourself. That's good. That's a good way to to leave it sort of. The thing is, it's a great debate in the movie, too. Yeah. And LBJ does not come off like a bad man or a racist or anything like that. He comes off as a very canny politician. Um, so, uh, we've been talking about some of the best movies of the year, uh, and we were saying off the air. It's amazing how Boyhood is almost a consensus. There's almost as close to a critical consensus as you'll ever see for Boyhood is the best movie of the year. What about the worst movie? What are you going to say was the worst movie of the year? Because you haven't plunk down your money in print yet on this, I don't think. No, I may not do it this year. I'm very, very lucky now. Uh, if anybody reads um, New York Magazine or, or Vulture, I have a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant sec- so-called second-string critic named Bill Gabiri, and he just sees all the crap. <laughs> I just said... <laughs> I used to do that for Malcolm Johnson. Uh, I should quickly <laughs> say, by the way, while we're talking about this, our phone number is 860-275-7266. If your name is not Wendy and you have the worst movie of the year that you saw, 860-275-7266. So you don't have to see all the bad stuff. No. I, I mean, I do. I do see a lot of it. I will say that um, I'm, I'm very outraged that there is a film that was supposed to be released in 2013 and ended up being an opened in a theater in L.A. for like three days to qualify for awards and then opened in January 2014 that people have forgotten. And uh, it was uh, young uh, Jason Reitman's last movie called Labor Day. Oh, yeah. Uh, with Josh Brolin. <laughs> with and... uh, Josh Brolin and Kate Winslet. Yeah. And uh, Josh Brolin is a uh, an escaped prisoner who, and who pie bakes. And pie maker who bakes her uh, a pie, a peach pie. Uh, It's really one of the worst films I've ever seen. And it's just, to me, I'm so indignant that it's not... It it was too late to make anybody's uh, list last year of worst films, you know, Razzie Awards... But it's too early. It was came out too early this year. I wonder. So. I wonder if they're just starting to intentionally do that too. Obviously, we know <laughs> that the films are released to qualify for the Oscars at a certain time. I wonder if they're re- released at a certain time to avoid the worst film list. I, I, I mean, there's some little movies like you and I both hated. Listen up, Philip. But nobody saw Listen Up, Philip, and nobody's going to see Little. Uh, well, you know, you know what, you know what. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, uh, A. O. Scott, our buddy, who yeah. I've often been on your show right. with, um, is in is in Mexico now on holiday, which is a good thing because he put Listen Up, Philip on his 10 best I list. I uh, so Several, and he's not the only person who did that. And it, it's a really terrible movie. It's, un- it's not even, it's unwatchable. It's an <laughs> unwatchable movie. It's a movie that you don't even know why it was, what the director thought he was doing. Right. It's, it has Jason Schwartzman as this hateful, irascible, miserable author, sort of a, I don't know, Pseudo Philip Roth, who's also in the thrall of a Philip Roth like mentor, and oh. it's just one scene after another of him being being a an a hole to people, and and that's all. That's the structure of every scene, and but that's he's the not. One, that's the one sheet. But he's not an entertaining one. You yeah. see, he's not. 
Uh, I, I was just rewatching this great Simon Gray play called Butley with uh, Alan that Alan Bates did. There's a movie of it where he's an a-hole in every scene to everybody, but he's hilarious, you know. Mm. Or or Saint Vincent, you know, whatever you're going to say about Saint Vincent, the way in which uh, Bill Murray it, it turns very sentimental, but Bill Murray is really funny when he's being a creep. The guy in Listen Up, Philip. Like the guy in Greenberg, that Noah Baumbach movie yeah. that Tony Scott also put on his <laughs> ten best of of the year list, and you know, I, I you know I, I I tore him a new one when he when he did that about Greenberg, and and he came back and said, well, that's only because you're so much like Greenberg that you can't see how funny it is. <laughs> so um, maybe so, maybe it's a very Greenbergian thing to thing to do. I don't know. You and I don't ever agree about anything, and we totally agree about uh, Listen to Philip. When we when we come back to this topic, though, I will tell you what. I, what I would nominate as the worst movie of the year. But first of all, here's Laurie and Gail Sperry, who wants to talk about a good movie, I think. Uh, hi, Laurie. You're on the air with David Edelstein. And you're not there. Hi. Oh, there you are. Um, hi. Hi, Laurie. Hi. Thanks. Um, so I wanted to ask about uh, what um, David Edelstein thinks about um, The American Sniper. I haven't seen it or anything, but um, I just heard that, that um, Bradley Cooper was snubbed for – and the movie was snubbed in terms of getting any nominations. Well, and, we, have, uh, we don't know the Oscar. The, we don't know the Oscar nominations yet. I mean, the Golden Globes would be the only nominations. Just to sort oh, of okay. just to help orient yeah. people, this is a movie made by Clint Eastwood. It's about a real, actual uh, American veteran, Chris Kyle. Uh, and yeah, you take over. <clears throat> well, um, first of all, Bradley Cooper is phenomenal. You will barely recognize him, not physically, although he is, you know, really stripped down. And rebuilt. I mean, he has, you know, he this guy goes through punishing Navy SEAL training, and you really believe when you look at uh, Cooper's physique that he went through this too, that he tortured himself to get to this state. Uh, we think of Cooper as a very sort of congenial actor. He's playing a very remote, very haunted guy. Um, <clears throat> it's a fascinating performance. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece of filmmaking. You can't believe that Clint Eastwood is. 106 or whatever he is now because he's trying to out Catherine Bigelow, Catherine Bigelow. He's not doing the sort of old master thing, you know, slow kind of long takes. Mm -hmm. He's really in the middle of the action. So <clears throat> phenomenally made movie with a phenomenal performance. Um, I think it's a really also hateful movie politically for a lot of reasons. It, it's another one of these movies that views the Iraq conflict in a complete vacuum. You know, there, there's no explanation for why we're there. We're just fighting really terrible guys. And, you know, we're the the it's one cliche after another. You know, when a guy says to him, will you be the best man at my wedding? And he says, yes, you really know that, you know, the next thing you're going to see is this guy getting blown away. Mm. Uh, spoiler. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, basically you could do that all the way through the movie. Um, and it's. um and they create this this psycho uh, nemesis, this this uh, um, you know Moriarty like Iraqi sniper to go after him, you know, to go after him all the time, so they can have a final climactic face off. Um, it's a really oh, it, it also suggests that nine eleven, you know, it, that that it was uh, we went into Iraq because of nine eleven. Um, that there's a direct connection between 9/11 and the and and, well, and Joe Lieberman was a script consultant on the yeah I guess so I guess so uh, so uh, for all kinds of reasons I found it a, a really hateful film and I've been you know v pretty thoroughly and savagely attacked on my you know my own website for for saying these things about the film by you know the, by the platoons of uh, either. Um, Vets or people or the armchair warriors who read um, hard right wing uh, websites. When you say armchair warriors, you're not referring to Clint Eastwood talking to a chair. Right? <laughs> like, 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 that no. wasn't a, it wasn't a subtle dig, was it? No, no. Uh, I wish it had been. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think Bradley Cooper deserves an Oscar maybe for that performance, plus the voice of the raccoon in Guard Guardians of the Galaxy. You put those two performances together. I uh, think. I think, Colin, you said. 
before that if 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 Chris Kyle was played as a raccoon, that the movie would have been yeah, and remarkable. Then, and then you've got something, and that maybe maybe uh, takes uh, some of the other fantasy elements out of it. Exactly. All right. Exactly. So let's go about worst movie of the year. I I'm going to push for if if I have any uh, clout anywhere for I, I didn't see as many I don't see anywhere near as many movies as you do. I you know I always feel like the movie that has the most pretension and aspiration that goes the most dramatically awry. Is that should be the best movie, that the worst movie of the year for me? That's Noah. That's Darren Aronofsky completely <laughs> going off the rails, <laughs> and and I mean, and taking a certain amount of liberty with with text also. <laughs> I might add. Uh, well, you, but you didn't see Exodus, Scott. No, I haven't seen King, Exodus yet. Did no. you? No, that, that's uh, Ridley Scott, right? Also going yes, off the rails. Yes. But see, we know Ridley Scott's going to get back on the rails. I'm not convinced Darren Aronofsky is ever going to find his way back to reality. There's like a steady creep away from it if you look at his movies. It's and, not a very personal movie for him, though, actually. He's, uh, he does better when he's portraying people who are in some sort of drug state, either literally or sort of self-induced. Like in the, like in his wrestler movie, um, and he tries to make Noah kind of a he tries to tries to make Noah kind of a guy who's addicted to uh, to hallucinogens. Really, he, you know, yeah. the whole thing is, you know, the best you can say for that movie. I didn't hate it as much as you did. Was that you could take it as a giant hallucinogenic episode, or you could take hallucinogens before you go see the movie. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's no longer an option at our age. <laughs> I don't know. I kept wishing that there were. I like I, I you know I like humor and everything even in the most serious stuff and right. when I was watching that movie was it a New Yorker cartoon there were like these two strange dinosaur like beasts mm-hmm. watching this uh watching this giant boat full of animals moving away and mm-hmm. and one looks at the other and says wait was that today <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, that's good. And well, I really wanted that. Yeah, no, there is not a joke anywhere in that movie. No. There's no joke. So uh, we have a limited amount of time left, David Edelstein. You can either talk about what you thought was the worst movie of the year, or you can begin to set the stage for us to see maybe one of the smaller movies that you really liked that, that could easily sail by people. Like, I know you like the latest Cotillard uh, vehicle, which is either called Two Days and One Night or One Day and Two Nights. Or well, I like Cotillard. Uh, like, from, from my money, Marion Cotillard is the greatest uh, film actress in the world right now. Um, that is, um, and I love uh, awarding that prize every year so I can meet another um, actress who will come up and say, thank you so much for saying <laughs> that about me. Um, and, she's, she, and she's amazing in two movies, The Immigrant uh, by James Gray which is a, she plays a young Polish woman. It's a very kind of moody, slow period drama with Joaquin Phoenix, who plays a sort of soulful, tortured pimp. And you can see that on, on VOD now and on DVD. And this uh, Darden Brothers uh, movie called Two Days, One Night, in which she plays a woman who uh, has been not been working because she had a depressive episode. And her boss, get this, her boss tells all her co-workers that either he fires her, if he fires her, he's going to give them a big bonus at the holiday, or they could keep her on and they won't get a bonus, and they can vote on her fate. I think TIC did that with me. <laughs> I think so, too. I think so, too. Um, and this is a, um, so the movie is literally her going to each one of her co-workers and pleading her case, telling them, to think that, you know, she has this family, she has these kids, please, you know, don't take their bonus, and them telling her, well, they need their bonuses. And, it, you know, it comes down to the wire, and it's a, it's, you know, it's a capitalist horror story. Um, I recommend it very highly. I recommend Mr. Turner, when you see it, see it on the biggest screen you can find. Uh, it's a biopic of uh, J.M.W. Turner, The Great Landscape, painter, English landscape painter, played by Timothy Spall. It is like no biopic you've ever seen. It does not have the usual Freudian crap and the, the you know, the a lot of exposition and the usual biopic signposts. Um, it's really just kind of free-floating, and Spall plays him as just this grotesque little Quasimodo-like figure who totters all around the landscape, sort of sniffing at the air, um, and, and grunting. We have to go. But grunting, maybe maybe we, yes. should, we should just end with our Timothy Spall, Mr. Turner impersonations. <laughs> yes. I'll do my, I'll go first. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> 
Mm. Happy, <laughs> happy, happy New Year. Mm. Happy New Year. He doesn't actually say Happy New Year in the no. movie, however. No. All right. Thanks very much to David you know Elstein from Fresh Air from CBS Sunday My Morning. Pleasure. From New York Magazine. Thank you so much. All right. Come back right. soon. <laughs> soon. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Kim Jong-un can add making me explain the plot of the interview to my mom to his lists of acts of terrorism. Meanwhile, the people of North Korea are all, what's a movie?